responsible for the session sharing this track. And with that, I'm happy to announce Luther Wiltra. He's going to talk about functional programming with. Okay. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, let me just turn this down a little bit. Uh, so many of us in the room. Uh, so I'm uh, Bart Schiest, uh, I'm here by Bart Schiest, uh, I'm a lecturer at the University of Utrecht, and let me start by telling you a little bit about Swift and how I got to know something about this topic. So Swift is uh, Apple's new language for development on Cocoa, uh, iOS, OS X development, um, and it's relatively new, it was kind of announced at the big uh, developer conference in June 2014. And up to that point, I had kind of dabbled in Objective-C, which is the language which is kind of up till then had always been used to write applications for iPhones and Macs. But it, I, I don't know, it, it kind of, it's not, it, the syntax isn't very pretty, and I kind of did some Hello World apps and, you know, kind of had Windows pop up and that kind of thing, and then I realized that uh, it's, if I'm not paid to write in this language, I'm probably going to prefer to do my teaching and um, research using other languages. So it never really grew on me. And then Swift got announced, and I, thought, I looked at it, and I thought, okay, it seems like a, like a pretty decent language, and I was really happy about this. And I got in touch with a friend of mine, Chris, who's uh, going to be giving one of the, the, the tutorials uh, later this afternoon. And Chris studied in Utrecht, so he's a background in functional programming. And um, uh, but he kind of went on to be an iOS developer and kind of got paid to do work in Objective-C. And I said, well, what do you think of this language? And he was really excited about it. And one of the things he does in his spare time is he runs a website, site, Objective-C.io, which, um, where they talk about, or kind of have monthly issues about Objective-C development. And uh, Chris said, you know what, I, I'm so excited about Swift and I'm so excited about kind of telling people about functional programming in Swift, let's write a book together. And, uh, uh, Chris invited Florian on board, who uh, is our third co-author, who uh, runs Objective-C.io with him. And uh, we kind of worked over the summer, and then kind of in October, November, we, uh, uh, we, we announced the book. And uh, that's a lot of fun. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about kind of uh, some of the examples we do in the book, and uh, what you can do in Swift, and what functional programming is about. So it's kind of tricky, right? Because it's a very diverse audience. I imagine some of you have done a lot of functional programming in other languages. Some of you maybe know a little bit about uh, uh, Coco and uh, the existing Apple frameworks and are interested in, 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 in Swift. Some of you might have looked at Swift already or know nothing about it. So I'd like to kind of very broadly talk about uh, what kind of language Swift is. So if you look at the, um, the announcement at WWDC, uh, Craig uh, Federighi, who is the kind of Apple uh, vice president of engineering, he uh, said it's like Objective-C without the C. And what he meant by that, it doesn't have all the baggage that Objective-C carries around with it. So it's a completely new language. But it's, it's that's slightly a misleading comment. If you look at the developer forums, Chris Latner, who's one of the main engineers behind Swift, uh, he has a really nice quote which says, Objective-C without the C implies something subtractive. But Swift actually dramatically expands the design space through the introduction of generics and functional programming. <coughs> so here it's really clear that uh, Chris Latner, who uh, is famous for a lot of his work on LLVM, that he, he recognizes that by design, Swift has a lot of new opportunities for doing things uh, more functionally. So that begs the question of what is functional programming? And this is really hard to define. Um, it's like if I had one slide where I could say, oh, what is object-oriented programming? It's tricky. Um, there are lots of languages with objects. Um, you can have a lot of uh, examples of really badly designed object-oriented code or really well-designed object-oriented <coughs> code. It's not like that you can say, oh, it's just programming with classes and attributes and UML. That's all there is to object-oriented programming. In the same way, a lot of people, when they think about functional programming, they think about functions like map and filter. So here's our kind of first little snippet of Swift code, um, where you see you have some array which has the numbers one, two, three in it, and then I'm going to call the function on that array map, and the argument I pass to map is a function. And the way you should read this is this is a function <laughs> which takes an argument x and then returns x plus one. So the result of this kind of uh, little snippet will be the array two, three, four. And people who think about functional programming often think about 
functions like that, and that, that uh, it's all about programming with higher order functions and map and filter of, and, and reduce. These are what define functional programming. It's true to an extent, but it's kind of like because these I think these are examples which are typically drawn from functional programming. But it's kind of the same ways that you might uh, think of uh, saying that object-oriented programming is all about shapes and animals because. These are the standard examples that you see whenever you learn object-oriented programming. You have like animals, and they have a number of legs, and then you have different kinds of animals, you have different kinds of shapes. So rather than uh, kind of focus on the, the fact that you have these higher order functions, or functions which take functions as arguments, or trying to come up with a kind of really concise definition of what makes a program functional or not, um, I, I think what we're looking at mostly is in the book is that we try to define what the characteristics are of, of functional programming or functional programs. And the, these are the three that we come up, came up with. They're probably not complete, they're probably not exhaustive, and uh, many people might disagree with some, some of these points. But uh, these are things which we consider important. So uh, modularity, and by that I don't mean modularity in the OO sense, right, where you plug your program is kind of split over objects and all these objects have responsibilities. The, the way you decompose a problem in, in kind of a more functional style is that you look at very small building blocks, you create very small values which solve maybe sub-problems, and then you define functions on top of that which combine some of the solutions of these sub-problems into the solution of some very, very big problem. So you're really looking for a, a high degree of composability or compositionality. Uh, the effective usage of types. So Swift has a very nice type system. Uh, you, can, you can do a lot more with Swift types than you can do with Objective-C. And the last point is a uh, kind of careful treatment of state and effects. So it's something you really see kind of which is forced upon you in some pure functional languages like Haskell. In Swift, you have the ability to do this uh, to, to some degree, to be, uh, to be careful about what, what kind of um, effects and state your code might manipulate. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is, unfortunately I'm not going to teach you Swift. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a super complicated language, but what I, it's, I don't want to kind of give a, a language tutorial here. Um, I also don't want to talk about like how to set up your first Xcode project and make a small iPhone app or anything like that. Um, but instead, what I want to try to do, my goal of this talk really, is to kind of showcase how you can take some of the ideas from functional programming and the fact that you have the big kind of Apple platform at your disposal, and you can maybe apply some of these ideas in your project. And if you go on to learn Swift, or if you go look at Coco, or maybe you're an iPhone develop developer already, maybe you can take some of these ideas and then uh, port them to this domain. So let me give you an example of the kind of thing uh, that we, well, this is an example we, from the book and the kind of thing that you can do with Swift. So Core Image. Core Image is a, uh, a library uh, or framework which Apple provides for uh, image manipulation. And this is one of the examples uh, uh, that, uh, that Chris and uh, Florian had a lot of ex experience with. So the software I'm using to give this presentation is actually uh, Dexec, which is an app they wrote which takes Markdown and produces slides like this. And what you can do is you can include images in your presentation. So this is a, a picture of San Francisco that Chris took on his holiday. But sometimes I want to use this as a background image. So um, to do that, I need to kind of run some filters over this image so that I can put text on top. In particular, I might want to blur it a little bit and then kind of uh, put some kind of change the color or add a color overlay so that it's a little bit more white so that I can put text on top and that it stays readable. So to do this uh, is pretty easy. Uh, Core Image exports a lot of uh, functionality that you can do this kind of filtering very easily. So here's kind of a, a snippet of Objective-C code. Um, if you can kind of read through the uh, square uh, parentheses, you can maybe get an idea of what's going on here. Is that you're creating some filter object called hue adjust, and you have to pass some string to, to initialize this filter, and then you need to set some defaults, then set some uh, set some keys, because uh, essentially these filters are built up by dictionaries mapping keys to well, any type or object or whatever. So it's a, it's a type about which you know nothing, essentially. 
So to use these filters, what you do is you need to set the uh, input image key, the, the KCI, so that's the key for core image, input image key. And uh, you need to set some other values for, uh, in this case, the uh, input angle key. And then uh, if I ask this filter to please give me the core image output image key, uh, the value associated with that, that'll be an object which I can then cast to a core image object uh, representing the image which has been filtered. So this is a, a really uh, useful library. I don't want to kind of be mean or nasty about core image. I think it's, uh, it does some amazing stuff. Um, if you look at the API though, I think it has some drawbacks. I think it, there's ways that it could be better. Um, if you forget to set some of the parameters, uh, or set uh, the wrong parameters, you might get a runtime crash. Because you asked for the output image, but you forgot to provide some input values. So then the filter tries to run, and it tries to read stuff from this dictionary, and boom. Uh, sorry, uh, we're, we're visiting a key, so we can't produce an output image. So it's also not type safe, in that you can set the wrong type of value. Uh, because this dictionary maps, once again, it maps right, these keys to any type. So if I set the wrong type for the input image and set a float instead of a core image image, um, you'll get a runtime crash. And it's also not modular in that there's no easy way to compose two filters. So if you looked at the example we had, I wanted to like blur the image a little bit and then add a color overlay on top of that. Maybe there's more steps that I wanted to kind of chain together. Um, because the way it's set up, that I have to kind of set up these big dictionaries and kind of set all the right keys and I can read the output image, um, that, that works very nicely. If you're running one filter, if you're running multiple filters, you have to do this kind of over and over again if you're, if you're not careful. So um, I want to present a slightly more functional solution. And this is Swift code. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to introduce a new type. And if you want, you can just uh, substitute globally filter by the function uh, type core image to core image. So what I'm doing here is I'm defining a filter just to be a function that transforms an image. So I haven't defined any filters yet, but I'm just specifying what the type of what, I, what I'm going to call filter from now on is just a function from core image to core image. So, uh, to give a kind of the first thing you might just do just to kind of get used to the syntax is define a filter which does nothing. It just takes an input image and returns that input image. So it's not very exciting, it doesn't do any, any actual filtering, it doesn't do any actual work, but it hopefully gives you an idea just to give you the syntax and how you go about defining these filter objects. So this is a Swift code here once again, I'm defining a function called no filter. it doesn't take any arguments, it returns a filter. And what does the body do? Well, I have to return a filter, and remember a filter is a fun function from image to image. So here with these parentheses, I create a closure which says, given an input image, just return the input image. So it doesn't do anything. But it's kind of nice to just uh, warm up a little bit. Because if I want to define a filter, I have to go through this kind of what I mentioned previously, uh, is you know setting up a dictionary object. So. Uh, so here's a blur filter, which takes a, a radius, which is a double, and then it runs a Gaussian blur over some image. So it has kind of, if you squint a little bit and you ignore the, the value being returned, it has the same structure. I'm taking some arguments, I'm returning a filter. To do that, I create a closure, which takes an input image, and then returns an output image. The only difference is, now I'm going to kind of create one of these dynamically typed uh, kind of dictionary things and set, set the input image to the image I receive. Then uh, kind of I'm going to uh, create this filter with some bunch of parameters and a name. And then I'm going to read at the output image, which is then the blurred image, and then I'm going to return that. So, um, so far we haven't done much, right? We've just basically kind of wrapped uh, our own little blur function around the existing blur functionality that you already have in core image. So if I want to actually run this image, what do I do is I need to get my hands on a core image uh, image, CI image here, which I can do by just you know reading the contents of a URL. And then I can create a, uh, a filter, which is a function from CI image to CI image, by just calling blur of five. And to actually get a blurred image, a CI image out, I need to apply this blurified function 
to my image that I've uh, created from this URL. So this will kind of, what this code does, reads in an image uh, from a URL, uh, creates a filter, uh, which is a Gaussian blur filter, and then blurs the image uh, accordingly. So I can play this game some more, right? I can look at all the functions that I might want to use from the core image library and then kind of write my own little kind of Swift functions, which, uh, which uh, are just full wrappers around uh, the Objective-C objective code. So this is one thing which, is re which I really like about Swift is, and there are lots of um, criticism you can have on the compiler, and it might not be uh, slightly buggy, it's still slightly buggy at times, but the interoperability with Objective-C is amazing. So I can kind of just call out um, uh, uh, to Objective-C and kind of interface with this whole core image library which is implemented in Objective-C and it's completely painless. So I write my little Swift wrappers. Uh, so these are kind of composite source overlay or color generators or color overlays or whatever. It doesn't really matter what these do. Uh, but you can, they, they have the same structure. You create these dictionary objects and set the input image key and then read the output image key over and over again. And so now I can look at filtering more than once. So I can, if I have some image and I have a blur radius and I have some overlay color, I can uh, create a blur image once again by taking by creating a blur filter, which uh, has this radius, and then by passing one argument, I'll get a uh, filter out, which is a function from image to image, and I can pass the image again, and then get the blurred image out. Similarly, uh, if I have this blurred image, then I can apply a second filter to this blurred image by creating a color overlay filter, and then kind of instantiating the overlay color I want, which is going to be white with some alpha component, and then applying that filter to the blurred image. So this is um, applying one filter after the other. And then the obvious question you can start to ask is, how do I compose these filter objects? Well, uh, quite easily. Uh, because we've defined these filters to be functions from CI image to CI image, we can define a compose filters function, which takes two filters and runs them one after the other. So well, this is defining a function that goes from, which takes a filter and another filter and returns a filter. So, how does that work? When we get our input image, we run it through the first filter, which gives us a new image, and we run that through the second filter, and then that's what we return. So, if we looked at this example that we saw previously, where we wanted to blur and then do a color overlay, we can do exactly that by first defining a composite filter, which consists of a blur and a color overlay, and then running that composite filter on some image. So, What's really nice is in Swift, it provides, uh, Swift gives you with quite a lot of flexibility to define your own operators if you want. So this is, isn't adding any kind of new kind of expressive power or changing the language in any way. It's just a syntactic nicety. So I can define an, an operator greater than, greater than, greater than, which has the same, exactly the same implementation as, uh, as for the, the composed filters functions on the previous slide. But now I can do kind of Unix uh, pipe style programming where I can kind of create all the filters I want and I can just chain them together <coughs> with this operator. So this gives me a very nice way to, uh, to assemble complex filters. So if we compare this uh, kind of this new interface which I've defined uh, to a two core image as opposed to the one we saw previously with the dictionaries, is suddenly we have uh, an interface which is both type safe and modular. So there's no way you can get these dynamic crashes as long as like our wrapping filters, the little kind of things, or the wrapper functions which we defined, like blur, as long as those don't make any mistakes. There's no way that someone can use this library and still get these dynamic crashes because of the type errors, that they're passing the wrong type to, or they're associating the wrong type to some dictionary. And it's modular. If we have some very big composite filter, we want to tease it into pieces, we can define these small filters and then just chain these uh, together. And the crucial kind of bit of technology which made this work was higher order functions that we could pass around functions as if they were as if they were just regular data. And this is something you could already do in Objective C if you've done Objective C programming using blocks. But it's slightly nicer in Swift. You have the syntactic nicety. You have the uh, the ability to define these operators, and it just works just that little bit more smoothly. So the crucial thing is uh, we have used higher order functions, but it was very much a means, not an end. What we were aiming for was an interface to core image that was type safe and modular and 
nice decompositional. And we did that, and we, we chose to represent filters as these functions. We could have made another choice. We could have just uh, used a, a flat definition that kind of assembled filters in, a, in another way. But uh, it was very much a means, not an end. So uh, it worked nicely in this example, at least. So let me give you uh, another example of uh, the kind of things you can do with types in Swift. Uh, going beyond just uh, the kind of the, the usual example of higher order functions or functions which take functions. And that has to do with enumerations. Um, so enumerations were already in Objective C. Uh, you, could, uh, you, uh, you could have enumerations defined like this. So this is uh, from the Objective C library for string encodings. They have an enumeration which says that you have a bunch of different string encodings, and these are basically just uh, names representing. Uh, constant integers, so that uh, when you want to open a file, that you pass a certain string encoding, and then it knows exactly kind of, uh, how to treat that raw data to generate a string object. Um, the drawback is that it really is just a very thin wrapper around the underlying integer. So you can do things like this. You can add two string encodings together, and that'll give you a new int, and then you can check if that's equal to some other string encoding, which is just an int. So it's um, Clearly, this kind of thing doesn't make sense. You don't. You want to warn people against doing this kind of thing. It's a bad idea. So Swift also has enumerations, but they introduce new types. They really change. Um, uh, these new types are completely separate from the underlying integers. So um, in addition, so we can't have the mistake of adding two string encodings or anything like that. In addition to that, um, uh, these. Enumerations might have associated values. So I'll give you, you, you give you an example of that in a few slides, and they can be decomposed through pattern matching. So, um, as an example, uh, suppose I want to read a file. If I um, look at kind of the Objective C Cocoa documentation, uh, you can see that there's an initializer to the uh, NS string class, uh, which will uh, which requires a few arguments, and then it'll give me a, a string. And I need to provide the file path, okay, that's fine. I need to provide the encoding, sure, I can just look at the documentation, figure out what, uh, what I need to do there. And then I need to provide an NS error star star thing. And these are, this is the usual way of kind of error handling in C. Whenever I see this, this is not something I do every day. I mean, I need to kind of go to Stack Overflow and then I have to look up, like, if I want to check for errors, do I have to check whether the error thing is nil or do I have to check whether the return value is kind of non-nil or whatever, right? And it, it's, not, it's not hard, right? It's not rocket science and if you've done it 10 times, you'll never forget the, the right order of these checks again. But it's, it's slightly, if you think about it, it's slightly weird that as a caller you have to kind of set up the memory for the error message in case that happens, and it's the whole way that the errors are handled kind of expose the fact that we're just kind of manipulating pointers at a very low level. We'd like something um, uh, where the types are at least more meaningful. So we can write a small wrapper around this function in Swift, where we require a string and some string encoding, and then what we'll return is not a string, but a string question mark. So that's to say, it's a string which could be nil. Uh, so what's very nice in Swift is that they track uh, null pointers or nil values in Objective-C uh, in the types. So that uh, when you call this function, you know something might go wrong. And if something does go wrong, uh, you'll get a nil value out. And if you call this function, you have to check whether something went wrong before you can manipulate the underlying string. So this is a, a much nicer interface, right? Because I don't have to, uh, I, as a user, I'm relieved from having to set up this, this kind of, pass this pointer for the error message and so forth. The only drawback is that if this function fails, if it returns nil, then I don't have a way to get my hands on the NS error object. I don't have a way to check uh, why did this function fail. So I've lost a bit of information, which I might want to keep. So the good news is there's a very nice solution to this problem, which is something like this where I define my own enumeration. And I have two possible kind of outcomes of trying to open the file. On the one hand, I can have success, in which case I'll have a string at my disposal, which is the result of reading the file. And on the other hand, I might have a failure, which means that I simply have an NS error object at my disposal, which I can use to report some meaningful error message. And uh, these are the two possible outcomes of reading a file, so I've created an enumeration with these two cases. 
and uh, these are called members in Swift speak, and uh, the string and NS error are called the associated values with these various members. So if I uh, kind of revisit my read file example, what do I do is I can now uh, kind of refine the type once more and say I take it, uh, the, the file path, which is the string, I take the encoding that I want, and then I return one of these results. And then here's kind of the Swift code which does that, where I kind of try to open the string, uh, where I, where I, I read this string in a string question mark, which we saw previously, and then I just check, well, did that succeed? And if it succeeds, I have an active <coughs> string object, which I can return. And if it didn't, I know that this maybe error guy, that that, that suddenly has a, has a value that I can report to the user. So that, um, this is using some of the built-in syntax and this uh, bang uh, for, for working with these optionals and with these question marks, which you saw previously. Um, the nice thing here, the important thing, is that suddenly I've given an interface where the user can see exactly what the result uh, of this function could be, a success or a failure, and in the success case I'll return a string, and in the, fa the failure case you'll get an NS error to use. And then to call this function, um, what, how does that work? Well, you can just have a switch where you try to read uh, some file with, the, with a certain encoding, and then you have two branches which you need to handle. One for let the file kind of successfully open, and then I have this, its contents here, and I can refer to that in the kind of remainder of the body down here. Or if I have a failure, I'll have an NS error object here which I can handle and then report that to the user. So the crucial insight really is that um, with these enumerations, we can model types more accurately. Um, so this is useful for error reporting or uh, all kinds of stuff. But uh, let me give you an example which is slightly different. And that has to do with uh, a small language for describing diagrams in Swift. So like any kind of programming language uh, these days, Swift has a, has a nice uh, kind of graphical uh, library called Core Graphics, or Objective-C rather, I should say. And you can draw pictures with core graphics. So you, uh, you have these core graphic contexts, and you can make rectangles and uh, set colors, and you can create pictures like this, and just kind of set the coordinates of where you want to draw this stuff, and then kind of, uh, you kind of draw it on paper, and then you figure out what the coordinates are that you want, and then you kind of try to translate that to, 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 to Objective-C or Swift, and then you look at the drawing, and if it's not what you want, you kind of tweak the parameters until you're happy. But the problem with kind of this way of uh, drawing graphics is it's once again, it's not very compositional. If I wanted to draw this instead of this, okay, how, what do I need to do? I kind of need to go back to my, uh, my calculations and look at my code and then figure out what parts need to move to the left and what parts need to move to the right and by how much and how, how, where do I, exactly do I assert the call to draw this new circle. So suddenly, uh, to make a very kind of innocent looking change, I need to redo all my code. So these drawing commands, once again, they're non-compositional. These hard-coded coordinates, they are they're, they're absolutely kind of killing for having any kind of compositionality. And the real problem is that they focus on how things should be drawn rather than focusing, giving the user a way to specify what he wants to draw. And if you want to make any changes to to a subdrawer, it means rewriting the entire code, right? Because all the coordinates might have changed, and uh, if you're unlucky, it means just a, a, a lot of work for you. So here's a kind of functional solution, um, which is compositional. It's strongly typed, and it's careful about uh, separating uh, the effects from the description. And how we'll, we'll draw, we'll make a small, very kind of mini the main specific language for these diagram descriptions. It's incomplete and you can't draw everything you can with core graphics using this library, but it uh, kind of gives you an indication of the, the, the more functional style of program. So the trick is that we kind of uh, separate, it's, it's a two-phase process, right? And the first step, what we'll do is we'll just give a description of the diagram that we want to draw. And this description doesn't do any drawing, it's just a piece of data which the user specifies saying, this is what I'd like to draw. And then you can think of it almost, in terms, if you're a compiler writer, as an abstract syntax tree. And then the next step is that we'll actually interpret this description using core graphics. So we'll do some calculation and figure out what the coordinates are that we need, and then uh, actually do the drawing uh, using core graphics. To give you a, a kind of a taster of the intended solution, 
you will kind of write a small library which, where you can do this, where you can specify that you want to have a blue square, which is a square which has relative size one, and it's filled with blue, and a red square, which is relative size two, which is filled with red, and a green circle, and then the picture I want is a blue square right next to a red square right next to a green circle. And in contrast to the previous example, if I now want to add this new cyan circle, I can just create a cyan circle and then insert it in the right place. So this, so this solution is really, it focuses on this compositionality aspect. I don't have to redo any of the coordinate computations, because that's something which the, the interpreter or the, uh, the compiler, so to speak, does for me. So how does this work? Um, it's really easy, actually, if you understand uh, uh, the importance of separating uh, the what from the how. So what, what you need to do is you come up with a small kind of data type, if you will or an enumeration representing what are the kind of things that I want to be able to draw. And uh, what I've chosen for here, so you have different choices once again, is to be able uh, to handle a bunch of primitive uh, uh, shapes, such as ellipses, uh, rectangles, and text. And then my little diagram language, it has a few kind of members in there. So I, on the one hand, I want to be able to draw these primitive objects, and I'll associate some size with that, some core graphic size. So I know how big of a square to draw. And then there are a bunch of uh, other members in there for composing larger diagrams. So this side takes one diagram, another diagram, and kind of sticks them next to another, one another. Or below takes one diagram, another diagram, and then sticks those on top of one another. Uh, attributed, I haven't defined the attribute enumeration, but I'll, I'll, I'll put that in there for adding things like colors. Um, and you can, uh, I think I'll only talk about colors now, but you, if you want kind of shading or any kind of more fancy stuff in there, you can include, uh, include that uh, right there. And then finally, there's uh, alignment, um, which, well, which takes a 2D vector, kind of specifying two numbers between 0 and 1, uh, representing kind of 0 being all the way to the left and 1 being all the way to the right, and, or all the way to the top, or all the way to the bottom. So that specifies how to align a certain shape in the given room available. Oh, I should maybe say that what I've done here is I've defined a recursive enumeration. I've defined a diagram enumeration, which, if you look at the beside and the below members, have diagrams contained in them. So this uh, currently needs a workaround in the Swift compiler. Uh, so what can we do with these diagrams? Is, uh, well, one thing we could do is, for example, compute the size that they need. And to do that is uh, we'll write a little uh, extension, or uh, you can think of this as a function which takes a diagram as input and then returns uh, the associated size. So uh, what do we do is we uh, write a switch statement to check kind of what branch are we in. And um, for all the different kind of members that we've defined previously, we have to think about how big is this thing. So if we have a primitive thing, we have a size object right there, and we can just return that. If we have some attributes on top of a diagram X, well, these attributes like color and filling and shading and so forth, they don't change the size, so we can just call this uh, recursively the size of the underlying diagram. If we have two diagrams next to one another, we can compute the size of the left thing and the size of the right thing. And the width of the composite diagram is the sum of the widths, and the height of the composite diagram is the max of the heights. So you do a few little computations like this, right? Um, I'm still not drawing diagrams, I'm just kind of showing how you can do calculations over these diagram descriptions. And then to actually draw these diagrams, I need to pass in some, uh, to find a new function, which I kind of provide the core graphics context and the bounds, which is the available space, and the diagram description, and then I'll just do uh, the actual core graphics call in order to make sure that this diagram gets visualized. So once again, the structure is uh, quite, uh, kind of, very much the same. You have a switch statement. And then you just go through all the different uh, alternatives that you have in your diagram description. And then you figure out what it is, what you want to do to draw this diagram. So in the case for a primitive uh, a shape, uh, such as an ellipse here, what do we do is we basically just call the context fill ellipse in rect func function from core graphics uh, with the core graphics context that we passed as an argument. And then we need to do a little bit of um, work here to figure out what uh, the alignment is that we want and how much size we uh, um, the size that we have that we'd like to take and the bounds describing the bounds of the box that we have available. So 
uh, I'm not defining the fit function here, but it's, it's not magic or anything, it's just a little bit of calculation to figure out how do I fit uh, this shape in the available size. More interestingly, if I have these composite diagrams, like one diagram next to one another, I can uh, uh, take the space I have available, figure out uh, how to divide that into their uh, kind of according to the relative sizes that I have. So that splits the available bounds into, uh, into two pieces. I have a left frame and a right frame. And I make two recursive calls just to draw the left diagram or the right diagram. So, I mean, I'm not defining the entire draw function, but you can, <laughs> by now you should kind of get a flavor of what you're doing to, to define this. And then once you have this in place, on top of this, you can build your own little library for, uh, for diagram descriptions. So I have a, a, a rectangle function, maybe, but if I want to provide squares where I don't want to specify that the, 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 the width and the height need to be the same, I can define a square function which returns a diagram, but takes a single argument and then just under the hood builds a rectangle. I can, once again, I can define these operators like three vertical bars or three dashes for composing diagrams next to each other or on top of one another. Uh, Swift has this extension mechanism so that I can, uh, if I want to add fill colors or alignment to the top or whatever, uh, that I can write, have this notation here where I can create a square of size two and then fill it with this color. So uh, this is basically, it's just wrapping an additional attribute or an additional alignment member around the existing diagram. So now I have everything in place to do this kind of, uh, kind of example that we saw previously. And I can even take this further and start to think about composing uh, arrays of diagrams, right? So if I have an array of diagrams and I want to uh, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of take this array and then kind of have them all next to one another, I can do that quite easily by doing things like uh, defining functions like hcat, which uh, reduce or just uh, iterate over this array, starting with an empty diagram and then all the and kind of chain together all the diagrams in the array using my little three bars operator. So it might seem like it's very much a toy library, but um, here's a kind of more realistic example where uh, suppose I have a dictionary which maps strings to ints. In this case, I have uh, cities with their names mapped to their population in millions. I want to draw a little bar graph. And uh, I might want to visualize that like this. So I have Berlin down here, New York, Istanbul, and so forth. Um, so to do this, uh, using this diagram example, is pretty easy. I just take my, uh, my input, which is a, a, a list of uh, strings and doubles, and I do some calculation to figure out what, what bars I want and what labels I want. To kind of assemble the labels, I take this horizontal concatenation of all the strings in my input for which I just create a text and uh, kind of align them to the top. For, uh, to create the bars, I need to normalize the input a little bit, so to kind of take the max, compute the maximum population and then maybe divide all the flows that I have by that maximum population. And then once again, I take the horizontal composition of a bunch of rectangles which are black and aligned to the bottom. And kind of in kind of one slide and 10 lines of code, I have everything you need. Draw diagrams like this. This is kind of cool, right? I think this is a really nice application of, uh, of this technology. So let's step back one more time. So what we've seen in our diagrams library yeah, is uh, we have a small compositional uh, language for de for defining these diagrams, and it's easy to extend. If you have, if you're in a certain domain and you want to draw certain kinds of diagrams, you can build your own little functions and combinators on top. Of it. And the key reason why it works is that we have the separation between the what and the so we had a little language for describing kind of what kind of diagrams we want to draw, and then we had our functions which assigned some kind of semantics, which computed the actual drawing of the diagrams uh, from their descriptions. And uh, this isn't unique to Swift, it's, um, you see it in a lot of functional languages, you see it in a lot of other languages, but having these enumerations, the switch statements, the fancy types, it, it kind of, uh, it, it feels much more natural than it does if you try to do this in objective C. So there are lots of things in Swift I haven't talked about. Things like uh, generics and protocols and the fancy types, you have sequences and generators. Uh, you, if you want to test functional code, we have a small port of QuickCheck, uh, which is a great testing library for random testing of, uh, of, uh, of code, uh, inspired by the Haskell library, which we, uh, which we ported. 
So uh, you could think about uh, parser combinators, type level programming, all kinds of fancy stuff that you can do in Swift, which I haven't had an opportunity to talk about. But what I'd really like to mention is that um, what you see is that Swift is kind of in June, it was announced and there were some betas out, and now it's kind of becoming more and more stable, the compiler and all the infrastructure, and uh, Apple is starting to more actively push Swift, to not kind of ramming it down your throat just yet as a, if you're an iOS or a Cocoa developer. But it's starting to take off, and they will, they will push it more actively over the coming years. And what I find exciting about Swift is that you have, I think there are a lot of really great functional languages out there, whether you like OCaml or Haskell or um, Agda or Beatrice or whatever, um, and there are a lot of really great platforms like .NET and uh, the JVM and Cocoa. And Swift offers this new uh, point in this kind of whole spectrum of providing both an interesting language and a great platform. So suddenly I can program my Apple Mac in a language which uh, doesn't require memory management and need to do all this crazy stuff. So if you want to know more, there's lots of Apple documentation. We have the Swift tutorial today. There's been a conference on functional Swift. Um, the, all the videos are on YouTube. There's some great stuff there. Uh, Objective-C.io issue 16 is a special on Swift if you're interested in functional programming stuff. We have a summer school, two weeks, which we run every year in Utrecht, which is uh, a really good uh, training in Haskell. If you want to learn Haskell and uh, apply these ideas in whatever language, whether it's Swift or the uh, other languages you, uh, you guys work in, it's a great opportunity to uh, learn more there. Okay, I'm happy to take questions. It's a process of many years. I think what we'll see is, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert Apple watcher, and uh, Chris and Florian, they have a lot more experience of kind of monitoring Apple's kind of uh, politics about this. I expect what we'll see is um, new APIs like WatchKit for the Apple Watch, for example, they're still very much Objective-C, and they realize that Swift is still not mature enough. Um, what will happen in the next years is that they'll kind of actively push Swift and Objective-C will become more and more deprecated. And as a result, um, one of the things they've done already is provide Swift wrappers around a lot of uh, Objective-C libraries and frameworks. These tend to be very much a port of the, uh, just kind of providing exactly the same interface but Swiftified uh, using optionals and be careful about which values can be nil, that kind of thing. Maybe once they have, kind of their, their priority is at the moment getting the language, the infrastructure, the platform stable. And from there I expect them to grow and do, um, to get rid of, for example, the, 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 the kind of Objective-C uh, pattern where you have these very untyped dictionaries, very dynamic, right? And push more to something which is safer and, uh, provides more static guarantees. I think that's what their, their goal was with Swift has been, and that's what they're aiming for, but it'll take, it'll take them a while to get there. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so I have a more general kind of question sure. uh, around Swift. Uh, do you think it's a shortcoming of the language that uh, it wasn't ever made open source? Um, it's not a shortcoming of the language, and I can understand why they made this choice. Um, personally, I think if you look at the people involved in Swift, it's a lot of the people who've done LVM stuff. So uh, potentially, it could be open sourced at some point. Uh, whether that's uh, Apple's strategy, I don't know. I, I could, I, I imagine that maybe many of the engineers would like to do this, but at the same time when it's still in beta, when it's still kind of developing and they want to keep it like under complete control for now, uh, I can understand that. Um, I think it is a limitation. I mean, I talk to people, I mean, when I give this talk, 
to, to wide audiences, they say, yeah, but I don't have a Mac, or can I try a language? And like, sorry, no. I mean, it's, um, it's, they've had to make a huge investment to, to make this language. Many, many years have gone into this. And they want to control it for now. And then once it's more stable, once they've kind of ironed out the last bugs, maybe they'll open source it, maybe people will try to port it to other platforms. But at the moment, it is very much, uh, it's a strength and the weakness of the language, right? The strength is you get Cocoa, and you get to write iOS and OS X apps in a kind of moderately nice language, pretty modern, and has a lot of features that, I, that I'd like to see in that. But the drawback is, yes, it's, it's proprietary. Uh, What's uh, your experience regarding performance? Um, to, both compared to Objective-C, but also compared to functional languages like yes. Camel. Um, it depends. Uh, it's hard to say. I think there are not many people with huge Swift code bases. Um, the compiler itself can be pretty slow, and the compiler itself can be pretty buggy. Um, regarding performance of Swift code, uh, I don't know of any, I mean, Apple always publishes, oh, it's so much faster than Objective-C, and there are certain things which, yes, like uh, uh, type, type languages, they don't have to do some of the dynamic checking, so they get some performance gains there. Um, I know that the people involved in the Swift compilers, there are a lot of C++ hackers there who are really keen about performance. So it's, it's, not, it's not a slow language. Um, it is, I didn't mention this in the talk, but it's reference counted, not garbage collected, which means that I mean, it's one of these design choices that, uh, that they make, uh, whether it's a problem if you write weird mutually recursive functions that you get space leaks because they're not garbage collected. I, I don't know why I find that hard. Is it memory hungry? Uh, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, uh, no, it's not memory hungry, but it's performance can be an issue. I mean, the people who make this language, so if, if, if we talk about right now, it's an issue. In a few years, I think it will be one of the fastest, fastest languages ever, because these are the people that make the whole stack, right from LLVM to Clang, and Swift, so they know, these are the people that built this entire stack, so they really know how to make this pass. If there's anybody in the world who can do this, it's them. Um, however, right now, so we are building a big app in Swift, and um, if you right now uh, turn on optimizations, sometimes you get crashes at runtime that you don't get when you turn off the optimizations. So in theory, it's very, very fast, and it can do lots of nice things and inspect the code. In practice, you cannot turn on any of the optimizations because it might crash at runtime. Um, yeah, yeah. It's still only like less than a year old since the beta was announced, and it's only been out of beta for a few months. So it's still, and people complain about this a lot, but it's you have to. Se I think it's important to separate kind of the compiler issues. And the, I mean, it's clear that they needed to have a release at WWDC June 2014. And that meant that they had to prioritize. They had to have flawless interoperability with Objective-C. And they nailed that. that they, it's amazing. Okay, they, get, they should get a lot of credit for that. Um, at the same time, like if I talk to FP people in academia, and they say, what, you can't do recursive data types? You can't even do lists without like the compiler blowing up in your face, they start laughing, right? But that's not what they care about. And, and now they're going to start ironing out all of these compiler bugs, uh, improve kind of some of the, 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 the limitations of the language that, that, are, that are known, that are out there, and then it'll, it'll, it'll grow. That's my expectation. Yeah. Great. Thank you. We have a break now. The next talks here in the talk back start at 11.30. Uh, at the same time, we have new tutorials starting over in the tutorial wing. Thank you.